Okay. Who is ready for the 100% definitive, totally canon, until further notice, family tree of Shanks? All right, because I have it all laid out, and I think it's going to work fine, okay, until Oda comes back from break. Then we'll see what he has going for him. But for right now, first of all, we have Shanks, right? Everybody knows him. Everybody loves him. He's got red hair. He's got a scar. He's got one arm. He uses a sword. He slices mountains in half. We all love Shanks. Shanks's father was introduced in the last chapter of One Piece, of course. Chapter 1086, if you haven't read it yet, please go and check it out. We have Saint Garling Figarland, who is the supreme commander of the God's Knights, who, which are in of themselves an elite group of Tenerubito that are like the, some of the strongest characters in all of One Piece that we're being introduced to now in this later stage, okay? And Garling Figarland is their commander. He's the chief justice of the court, as it were. And he himself is a really old dude with really cool glasses and a cool hairstyle. I mean, cool is kind of, you know, uh, subjective, but I'm going to go ahead with it. He has his hair styled like a crescent moon. I'll tell you what, if anybody can make the crescent moon hairstyle work, it's St. Garling Figarland, okay? So anyway, yeah, he is Shanks' dad, obviously, right? Because we know the connections between Shanks and the Figarland family from One Piece Film Red with, uh, you know, the Gorosei mentioned it with Uta and everything like that, so that's obviously Shanks' dad. We're also going to add St. Garling to the uh, roster of really strong old dudes in One Piece that can, like, you know, are essentially essentially one-man armies that can obliterate an entire nation by themselves. All right, I think it's fair to add him to that roster with such names as Dark King Silver's Rayleigh, uh, The Fist Garp, uh, The Buddha Sengoku, and of course, Whitebeard the Whitebeard, you know, back when he was alive. All right, so yeah, just really old dudes. I feel like I said this in a stream when I was trying to get, gauge the power level of Garling. I just like, honestly, if he's not at least the power level of Rayleigh as he is right now, then like, what's the point of introducing Introducing an old dude at this point in the One Piece story, right? If he's not at least strong as Rayleigh. And that's important to mention. He might not be as strong. He might not be the strongest member of the God's Knights. He might just be their commander. He's really powerful, but just like Rayleigh, who's pushing 80 years old, is like, ah, I ain't as young as I used to be kind of situation. Might be the same thing with him. But that's Shanks' father. What about the rest of Shanks' immediate family, okay? Well, did you know Shanks actually has a sister? What? Shanks has a sister? I didn't know that was canon. Well, it is now. Now, Shanks has a wicked hot sister who's a twin sister. They were separated at birth. You know, Shanks ended up in the treasure chest and wound up on the Oro Jackson. It was the apprentice pirate for Roger and everything. And Shanks' sister went on to train in all these different types of martial arts and pick up a sword as well. And she is one of the knights of the gods' knights. That's crazy. What else is going on? Well, Shanks also has a younger brother. That's right. The youngest sibling, Hanks. Not Hank, Hanks. Now, Hanks' story is a little bit different. Uh, he actually, you know, escaped the Tenrubito and Marijua and went on to work at a hardware store, kind of the equivalent of a Home Depot uh, in the One Piece world, you know. So he's working at a hardware store. He's in the kitchen appliances department right now. He wants to work in paint, but they didn't have any openings when he applied. So he's in the kitchen appliances, you know. It's, it's, a, it's not a glamorous job. He's not a Yonko. He's not one of the God's Knights. Um, but, you know, he puts his leg on one leg at the time, just like everybody else does. He goes to work uh, 9 to 5, you know, sells people various refrigerators and stoves. They have refrigerators in the One Piece world. That is definitely canon. So there you go. There's Shanks' immediate family tree. Him, his sister, his little brother, and his dad. Oh, Shanks' mother. Uh, oh, yeah, she died. There you go. That's an easy, that's an easy out for most, you know, anime mothers. Like, what about his mother? Oh, she died. I'm like, oh, okay. Immediately after having the three children, she got generic anime mom disease and she died. Really sad. Anyway, okay. So, uh, yeah, that, we'll just roll with that for right now. So, yeah, today we're going to be primarily talking about uh, the, the individual. I mean, we don't know for a fact that he's actually Shanks' dad, but we know that there is a connection to the Figarland family with Shanks, and this is the first named character we're being introduced to, you know, fully. Um, in terms of design, there's really nothing... Well, okay, there's a couple of things, like, aesthetic-wise that you might be able to compare Garling to Shanks, but overall... Like, you know, his hair doesn't really resemble Shanks' hair. It's, uh, I'm assuming white hair, grayed hair, because he's an old dude. So we don't know what his natural hair color was. If it was red hair, that would definitely give us something to go off of. But I'm assuming when he is animated, it's just going to be white hair, gray hair, just like Rayleigh's. Rayleigh is a 
originally blonde, and now he's just, you know, he went gray. So that's the case there. He decided to style it in the form of a moon, which I think works really well for him. Um, he has uh, a really cool pair of shades. He has, like, a hooked nose, which is not similar to Shanks. It actually resembles more of Kareha's nose, if anything, like that hooked kind of, like, witch nose like that uh, Kareha had. So, I don't know, maybe maybe Garling is related to Kareha in some way. That actually makes me start thinking, because in the last chapter they were they were talking about Ivankov was, you know, hypositing ways that Eam could still be alive 800 years later. And so one of the conclusions was like, well, we know there's a devil fruit that can, you know, grant you a, a form of immortality in eternal youth, the op-op fruit, which Law has. So if the op-op fruit was in the possession of the government for, let's say, a really long time, that's why Eam is immortal, uh, you know, maybe at some point, you know, I don't know, Kareha is Garling's brother, which would make Kareha Shanks' aunt? Yeah, okay, let's add that to the roster, okay? She steals the op-op fruit or somebody else she knows eats it and then grants her eternal youth. I, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just spitballing at this point, but it's just a similarity. So um, in terms of outfit, Garling wears this really cool long black trench coat with like some world government buttons on the sleeve, but he also is wearing like a high collared shirt underneath it. Who else wears a high collared shirt? Of course it's Shanks, you know, the, the similarities are, are piling up, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but obviously, I think that like the trench coat is maybe more of just like a formality because he is sort of like the, the supreme justice. Also, keep in mind when we see him in the last chapter, he was passing judgment on Miol's guard as like the supreme commander. Like they have dual responsibilities. The God's Knight are not just a bunch of brutes that are a fighting force. They are kind of like paladins in a way. They are noble. They are God's knights. They are the holy knights. All right. They're not just like you know. When is it time for us to go and cut things. You know, and there's another one that has like a giant club and he's like really stupid. When's it time for me to go smack things with club? It's like, hold on there. We have to wait. It's like, oh, I want to hit things with giant club. You know, no, these are, these are noble warriors that have jobs beyond just killing. All right. They have jobs in the way of like judging and keeping order and peace and, you know, all in order maintained in Marie Joie. OK, that's their main job. Um, as a side note to that, very quickly, uh, another reason why we're probably not finding out about them until just now. Honestly, I kind of like this now, the way that Oda is tackling this, because if you look back at the very beginning of One Piece where this story started, OK, in the East Blue, that was very small potatoes when it comes to the grand world at large. You, you know what I mean? Like Luffy fighting against Morgan's not Morgan's, Morgan, Captain Morgan, uh, you know, actually Zoro that cut him down, but you know, like, it was like, oh, he's a, a marine captain out in the sticks that was really cruel. You know, the God's Knights aren't gonna get involved in that. Oh no, they defeated Don Krieg, we better call the God's Knights and let them know. You know, the God's Knights are really, 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 really high up on the damn echelon here, okay? The fact that now we're moving into the final saga, the main villain of this story, I mean, yeah, we got Blackbeard and everything, but the main villain of this story that Oda is now going to start tackling is the world government at large. This is an ironclad organization that has existed for over 800 years, okay? So the fact that we're not finding out about the God's Knights until just now, I mean, you could say that, like, Oda could have foreshadowed them better, like, hundreds of chapters ago, but honestly, I think this works fine, because everything that's happened up until now, everything involving the Straw Hats and the Yonko and the Marines and the Admirals and, and the Cypher Pole and everything like that, all of that... They don't get involved yet. They don't get involved with Yonko. They don't get involved with Cypher Pool. They let them take care of it. You know, the, the reason the admirals are there to run the Marines, you know, the God's Knights aren't going to get involved with the Marines. That's not on their payroll. That's not on their, their list of their job description. You know what I mean? The fact we're finding out about them now is like, okay, shit's really getting real now. We're moving into the final saga. The world government is moving, and these are their top warriors. So just a little bit of a tangent there. Okay, back to it. So on top of the outfit he also has garling also has a saber it's a sword that looks similar to shanks's it has like the hand guard across it it's not the exact same design as griffin i'm assuming it's a saijo Wazamono. honestly maybe another reason why oda is going with the uh the god's knights right now it's because we now have way more opportunities to fill out the Mato grades. Because, you know, there's the 12 Saijo Awazamono grade swords, the greatest swords in the entire world. And so far, we only know, you know, canonically, we know about the Shodai Kotetsu, which is most likely worn by Samurai Gandhi, also known as Ethan. <laughs> Just, there's a Shodai Kotetsu wielded by Ethan. 
All right, Ethan, good job. Anybody that's watching this that's named Ethan, it's just like, I have the Shodai Kotetsu? It's just like, I guess you do, Ethan. Okay. We also have Murakumo Giri, which was Whitebeard's Bicento. Uh, we also have Yoru, which is Mihawk's uh, sword. Um, I don't know if it was 100% confirmed that Shanks' Griffin was a Saijo Awazamono. I, I think it was, so I'm just going to go with it. If it wasn't confirmed, it is. And so that's like four right there. So we still have like... You know, another, uh, another, uh, uh two thirds. Yes, another two thirds of the Sideshow Wazamona Great Swords. Not even counting that, getting into O Wazamona, there was 21 of those, and we don't even, I think, know about, uh, I don't even think we know 10 of the O Wazamonos. I know we know, we know, I'm not gonna go through all of them because I'll get confused, but we know with the Wado and the Shusui, and then we also have Enma. And uh, Ame no Habakiri's, that's four. I'm sure there's a couple more, but I don't think we're even close to knowing ten of those things. So, yeah, we can really fill out the Mato grades pretty quick. Honestly, Oda, just give... If Shanks' sister is part of the God's Knights, okay? Just give her two swords, you know? So it's like Shanks has to go up against his long-lost sister, and he pulls out Griffin, and he's like, ah ha ara 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 little brother. But did you not know I have two arms? Like, oh no! It's a wicked hot version! of Shanks that has two arms and two swords? This character is incredible. God, I hope Oda makes this character canon. Please, Oda. Shanks' wicked hot sister that uses two swords. Please! Okay, anyway, uh, moving forward, though. So, um, right, so now... In the chapter, we only get the one scene of Garling. We get his full body shot as he's kind of like sitting down like this, and then we get a close-up view of his face, and that's it. So some people have pointed out that we really only do see one arm. Garling is kind of sitting like cross like this, and we see his one arm. It would be, I guess, his right arm, and then we see his sword right at his side, right? So some people have wondered, like, well, does this mean he only has one arm? I would say no. I would say he's just crossing his arms like this, so you can't really see. He's like, oh my god, teching lost a hand! He's like, no, hello there. I, I have two. Whoa, okay. So I, I don't think he's missing an arm or a hand or anything like that. Also, I mean, like, just because, he, let, let's say he was. Like, let's say he was missing an arm. Does that automatically prove, like, you're the father! <laughs> your, your son is missing an arm because he had it bit off by a sea king, and the father is also missing an arm? That's, you know, clearly there's, like, genetics involved here. Well, then again, we don't know for exactly, because Crocodile Seraphim also has the scar that Crocodile has now, so maybe wounds can be genetic, although that doesn't make sense, because Shanks was born with two arms, you know? Shanks was born, and then his father looked down at him and was just like, Son, you're gonna lose that arm someday. It's already preordained. It is in the line of causality that you're gonna, you're gonna lose that arm. Okay. So... Until further notice, I'm just gonna say that Garling is Shanks' dad. Also, there was a conversation between Whitebeard and Shanks way back post Any's Lobby. I went back and reread those chapters. The first thing, or, or I, I actually think it is the first thing that Whitebeard says, because Shanks arrives on the Moby Dick, and, you know, when he's on the Moby Dick, it, he gets a little nervous, so he's firing off a lot of hockey, right? And a lot of the weaker members of the Whitebeard crew are just dropping, you know, like flies when Shanks walks on board. And um, I believe, yeah, the first thing that Whitebeard says to Shanks when he rolls up to him is like, ah, your damn face. Every time I look at you, that scar that guy gave me is starting to ache. You know, and then Shanks and Whitebeard have their conversation. Shanks gives him the sake, which, by the way, the sake from West Blue, we're going to go back to that in a moment. So um, that's like one of those little things that, you know, this was post Any's Lobby, so this was years and years ago. This might have been even, like, before YouTube existed or, like, right before, like, right around when YouTube was beginning. So there probably wasn't a lot of people making YouTube videos about One Piece back then, so a lot of people probably even forgot about this. But it really wouldn't make any sense. And obviously, Whitebeard did not say, like, every time I look at your face, Shanks, I remember the time that you cut me and I got a scar. Obviously, Whitebeard's way older than Shanks, you know, so it would have had to have been somebody else that looks like Shanks that caused the wound. Now, when we saw the silhouettes of the God's Knights a few chapters ago, by the way, St. Garling was not in those silhouettes. Well, at least we it wasn't super obvious. We didn't see, like, somebody with the crescent moon hair in the silhouette. We saw nine members in those silhouettes. Those might be the nine members, and then Garling is the tenth member who is the Supreme Commander, the Chief Justice, as it were. There might be even more members. I mean, if you want to go a whole Supreme Court thing with it, we could also have, like, eleven members, and then Garling is, is number twelve, right? We could just go with that. 
But so we know we know at least so far there's at least 10 members might be more. OK, so the whole idea is, though, that even if Shanks had an older brother who one of the silhouettes resembled Shanks. So it's like, OK, even if Shanks has an older brother like, you know, Shanks is uh, 39 years old. How older would his older brother be? I mean, I guess you could have an older brother that's like well over 10 years older than you. And maybe that's the person that Whitebeard was referring to. But no, 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 no. I don't think it was anything like that because it all falls into place. The bricks, the Lego bricks all make up a perfect uniform shape. When you look at the fact that Whitebeard was at God Valley 38 years ago confirmed with the rocks crew and we also know that saint garling figarland was the former king of that island he was the former king of god valley which is a very unique island you know like uh somebody brought up that like oh okay well the tenorubito left their islands to join you know the royal families at marie Joie. that's kind of the whole point of the tenorubito they don't rule over islands i feel like god valley was a very special case i feel like god valley was a unique island that might have not even exist well the island probably existed 800 years ago maybe that's like the haven where like dragons lived. like it was the dragon preserve and then the government took over and then they had to appoint one of their own a king. See, the thing you got to understand about the Tenerubito is that most of them are very pompous and self-entitled and arrogant like uh, Charlos and Roswald and everybody. That's the bulk. That's the majority that live in the city. But there are Tenerubito that do have a good head on their shoulders in terms of like tactics and planning and leadership skills and organization. You know, they're not always just like, you know, everyone go fetch me a bath. You know, now fetch me my toilet. Now fetch me my bidet. You know, it's nothing like that, you know. Now, Garling's personality, from what little we get of it, it's still very clearly in line with the rest of the Ten Rubito, as he states, as he's sentencing Mjolsgaard to death uh, on the world government cross. He's like, you know, those that protect scum are lower than the scum they protect. So he's still not a cool dude, all right? Um, but at least he's like, I'm a king, you know? I could do shit on my own, you know what I mean? I'm not gonna be as pompous as those in the city, and he can defend himself definitely, okay? He's definitely powerful, all right, on that regard. So he was the king of God Valley. So it would make sense that when Rox's crew rolled up to the island in their like little money making scheme or whatever they were specifically looking for at God Valley, um, they would run into the king. Now also you got Garp and Roger that rolled up a little later and then they're the ones that actually fought against Rox and that's why Rox isn't around anymore. Um, but I'd imagine the first line of defense they would encounter would probably be the king. In fact, I could totally see Garling back in his younger years in his heyday leading the charge, you know, like Rox's crew is approaching god valley and this is a well fortified like island you know you see it in the flashbacks it has those tall pillars like a fortress kind of thing these tall mountains so i could totally imagine rox's crew rolling up and then garling is there you know in his younger years with his cool king cloak and his crown on and everything has his whole army behind him and he's just like takes out his saber and he's like charge men we will not let god valley fall this day you know and then they just like start fighting and then it was Whitebeard that clashed with Garling. And if you look at Whitebeard's manly, impeccably chiseled chest, you could see a bunch of scars. And he's got like three piercing scars over here and then like another one over here. They look like scars that were dealt by some kind of piercing weapon rather than a slashing weapon or anything like that. It doesn't look like something that was dealt by like a great sword or an axe or something. They look like weapons from like, like a rapier or like a spear or something like that or the kind of wounds that he's got on his chest. Now, Whitebeard's got others scars all over his body except his back because he never ran away um but i could totally see the weapon that garling has being like a thrusting kind of piercing weapon like haha whitebeard you duel me today and then you know they're clashing there you got whitebeard's overwhelming power with his huge uh bisento murakumo giri and he's like bringing it down and maybe garling fought much more like um you know fleet of foot as it were he was like bouncing around the battlefield like aha you can't bounce like i can whitebeard beard and he's like clashing back and forth and like haha boom super you know high octane armament hockey thrust like boom like and he hits him like three times like a combo attack like right in whitebeard's chest and he's like oh you know and so it's like whitebeard's got overwhelming power but garling is just insanely fast maybe something like that right and that would also fall in line with shanks becoming a swordsman and really talented in his own right there okay 
So, yeah, I think that was the person Whitebeard was, refer was referring to in that chapter. I think it was Garling Figarland, the former king of God Valley there. And he survived the battle. I'm sure, I'm sure he has scars as well from the battle. I'm sure Whitebeard left a big, giant Murokumogiri scar right across uh, Garling's body. In fact, I would love, if we learn more about him, I would love for Garling to have a moment where he says the same thing that Whitebeard said to Shanks. Where Whitebeard said, you know, oh, if I just, lo just looking at your face makes me remember the scar that man gave me. What if Garling actually, oh boy, this could work because Weevil has been captured by Aramaki, Green Bull, bringing him back. I wonder what they're going to do with Weevil. Would they just chuck him and impel down? No, it, it might be a situation because he's a former warlord, yes, but he's also purportedly the son of Whitebeard, or at least the clone of Whitebeard. So wouldn't it be funny if Garling gets to see Weevil and just like, all right, we're already, we're already, court's already in session today. I already sentenced Mule's guard to death. Who else do we have? Do we have anybody else that we could sentence today? It's like, ah, oh, we just brought in Edward Weevil. It's like, all right, bring him in. And then he comes in and Edward Weevil's there. And he's like, he's crying because he misses his mama. And he's like, I want my mama. And he's just like, he's like, got the white beard and everything. He's looking right at Garling. And it's just this super silly panel where, you know, here's Weevil all crying and snot dripping down his nose and just, yeah. And then Garling just looks at him super seriously and he takes off his glasses and he's like, just looking at your face reminds me of the scar that man gave me. <laughs> just like, and then Weevil's like, oh, what? I don't know what's going on here. I want my mama. You know, just like, yeah, that, that would actually be really funny if they went that route with it. Oh my God. So, but I'm sure Whitebeard let him know. Okay. So that's, that's the case with Garling there. Um, so going back to the origin of Shanks, and I made a whole video about it, so I'm not going to go too into detail. You can go check out that video there. We got a little, um, pamphlet with Film Red, at least they did in Japan, that actually explains, like, how Roger found Shanks in a treasure chest, just like how Shanks finds Uta in a treasure chest years later. Garling might be the dude that puts these babies in treasure chests, and I have some, I have some evidence to back that up there, okay? It might be a situation where, okay, let's say Shanks is Garling's son, and so it's like, okay, it's like his newborn son, because Shanks is 39, God Valley was 38 years ago, his one-year-old son, might not even have been a year old yet, okay? And so, you know, Rock's Pirates are invading God Valley, and a Saint Garling is just like, all right, well, I have to make sure no matter what, my son is okay, you know, because he's like the heir to the throne and everything like that. So he takes his son, puts him in a treasure chest, and puts him in the most secure place in all of God Valley, where even if the rest of the entire island is burned down and decimated, this place will be okay. And that was most likely the vault, you know, the royal armory, not the armory, the royal vault, you know, where you keep, it's probably underground and whatever like that, in the rock or the mountains or the caves or something like that, a place that's heavily reinforced with steel to protect all of the valuables of God Valley. Like, that's probably the most secure place. So it would make sense why Garling, maybe not him himself, but maybe he, like, ordered somebody to, like, like a servant or somebody to hide him there. Um, and then you could have just said, well, Rox might have found his way to the, uh, to the uh, vaults, and he might have raided it with his crew, and then they found the chest, and they brought it back on the ship, and it wasn't until they were already at sea, they were sailing away from God Valley, they're like, oh, there's a baby in here, matey! You know, and then there you go. Also, Shanks was wearing, like, a onesie as a baby that has uh, stars and moons on it. And very clearly, St. Figarland has the, the moon as a shape, which maybe... Uh, um, obviously, Luffy is the son, but what if it was like um, the Figarland family? What if it was Garling and his wife had a sun and moon kind of design? Like he was the moon and maybe his wife, if his wife is still alive, had hair made like a sun. It could be something like that, right? And then Shanks was the sun and the moon, like the, the pajamas he was wearing or whatever, right? It, it could be a situation like that. Who knows? Um, now, something that Shanks says to Whitebeard when they did meet was, hey, I got this sake, this medicine, and it was from the West Blue. It's from my hometown in the West Blue. Give it a shot, Pops. And so he, you know, Whitebeard drinks it, and he's like, ah, it's not too bad, I guess. All right, now, because I rewatched that scene, like, just last night to prepare for this video, and it's like, okay, it doesn't really make that much sense for Shanks to be born in the West and then end up on God Valley. First of all, you know, if he's born in the West Blue, yeah, that does border the New World. Um, so you don't have to cross the Red Line, but you would have to cross the Calm Belt into the New World, which is very dangerous, especially for an infant. And also, it's like, 
God Valley. God Valley is a very, it's not just like, okay, if it was like Shanks washed ashore or somebody took him to a random island in the Grand Line, it's like, all right, that's still really dangerous, but like, okay. But God Valley of all places, you know what I mean? Like, that's really freaking crazy. So, um, Shanks is a clever guy. He's a clever bastard, if you knew anything, okay? I want you, I just want to paint this scenario for you, okay? Shanks has to go meet with Whitebeard. He sent the letter. Rockstar delivered the letter earlier. And then Whitebeard kind of ripped it up and was just like, if you want, if your captain wants to talk to me, tell him to roll up and talk to me. And then Rockstar's like, what? Okay. He goes back and tells Shanks this. And Shanks is like, all right, don't worry about it, Rockstar. I'll go visit Whitebeard myself. Okay. Shanks is smart. So he's like, how do I win over Whitebeard's... Like, how do I win over him? How do I get him to talk to me? All right? Whitebeard is not the kind of guy that's going to be impressed by vast amounts of money or status or power. That's not the kind of guy Whitebeard is. The kind of guy Whitebeard is is he loves his family, and he's much more old-fashioned. You know, he just likes, you know, he doesn't enjoy, like, doing, like, he's not a bougie kind of guy. He's not like, oh, yes, the finest steak tonight. No, he would be happy going to a nice family-run pub in the middle of some backwater island that, like, ah, oh, this hole in the wall. Come on, men, let's go have a great dinner in the pub. You know, it, he, that's the kind of guy Whitebeard is, right? So... What if Shanks is like, I'm just going to create this fucking story. I'm just going to create this story where, uh, yeah, I got this sake from the West Blue. It's my hometown. You know, a little, little tiny village tucked away in the mountains of the West. Not a lot of people have heard of it, but it makes wine, sake. They're really good at it. Give it a shot, pops. That's how you win over Whitebeard. You do not, like, for example, if Shanks would have rolled up with a giant bottle of, like, the best sake in the world, like, this is the finest sake, vintage, the year 1372, perfectly preserved with a, a devil fruit power, and it's been endowed with armament hockey, and it costs, like, you know, two billion berries for this bottle of sake. It's the greatest bottle ever, Pops. Here you go, Whitebeard. I think Whitebeard would have taken that sake, and he would have been like, huh... You're just like, you think you can buy me off with a fancy bottle of sake, you snot-nosed brat? You know what I mean? Like, you th you know, that's the kind of reaction I think Whitebeard would have. Um, but if you're just like, hey, this is this cheap bottle of sake, but it has character. You know, it's like, you know, it's a family-run business out in the West. I and it worked. It kind of worked. It's funny, because Whitebeard was like, not bad. Ugh. Man, there ain't a lot of people out in the world like there used to be. And then they start their conversation. Whitebeard would not know. I mean, Whitebeard, you know, Roger was the one that found Shanks in the treasure chest. And I'm sure Roger, later when Shanks was a little older, told him about where I found you, what your family name probably is, that kind of stuff. So I think Shanks knows. Shanks knows who he is. He's a member of the Figarland family. He knows that. But the rest of the world probably, I mean, the Gorosei would know, but, like, Whitebeard might not know. You know, the other Yonko might not know. All these, like, really high-profile people would not know. It's like the Roger Pirates would know. Buggy might know. Uh, Shanks himself knows. The Gorosei and the God's Knights, obviously, Garling would know if he is Shanks' dad. But Whitebeard might not know the story of Shanks. He might not know where Shanks comes from. Although, oh, shit, I just realized a huge gap in this. He did He did just also say, because I just said it, like, you, re you remind me of the dude that caused the scar. But that might not be, that might not be 100% one-to-one. That might just mean that, like, hey, the guy that sliced me had red hair back when Garling was younger. He had red hair, and then you have red hair. And every time I look at you, you know what I mean? It's just because, because going by just facial appearance alone, like I said, Garling doesn't look a lot like Shanks. You know, the nose is different. Obviously, the hair is different. Um, you know, so, so, and there's not a lot of other facial, like, that, like, like, scream immediately that, like, you're Shanks' dad. It's more of just, like, association with his name, okay? So, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's something like that. Maybe, maybe Whitebeard would, like, say to Shanks, like, oh, you look a lot like Garling, the former king of God Valley, and it's making my scars ache. And Shanks is just like, oh, I, I don't know what you're saying, man. I don't know. I'm just, I have red hair. It's like, yeah. Must just be the red hair. I was born in the West Blue. All right. I guess. <laughs> you know, like, that's just how that goes, right? Oh, man. Uh, anything else I wanted to bring up here with this one? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we still got to learn so much more about God Valley. We got to learn about how the fight went down there. But I think the way it went down is, yeah, the Rocks Pirates attacked. And by the way, with the Rocks Pirates really quick, um, 
because the way that Sengoku described this when he was talking to the other Marines was that the Rocks Pirates got together for a money-making scheme. Now, I don't know if that means, like, they were, like, like Shiki, Captain John, everybody were, like, part of that crew for a while, and then they attacked God Valley, or, like, the money-making scheme was just God Valley. So, Rocks might have had a crew beforehand, but it wasn't until they all attacked God Valley at once. That's when Whitebeard, Big Mom, Kaido, Wang Ji, Captain John, Silver Axe, and uh, Kaido, and everybody joined up and then attacked. They, that might have been, like, the first time they all worked together there, and it, like, fell apart immediately, like there was a mutiny or whatever. Could have been something like that. So I think, yeah, Garling and his army attacked first, and there was this massive battle going on between dragons and celestial dragons and God's Knights, and then, you know, Rox's crew, and then, boom, Roger and Garp arrived just when Garling is getting beaten down. So Because Garp said, you know, I had to protect the celestial dragons and their slaves. I had to protect their... Um, I had to protect this messed up system where slavery is allowed. And Garp was really embarrassed by that, and he didn't want to, like, you know, he didn't want to flout that later as, like, one of his accomplishments. Sengoku even mentions in that chapter that, like, the only reason Garp has not been let go for insubordination at this point is because his status and his heroic deeds. Like, they literally cannot fire Garp. They can't discipline Garp because he is a hero to the entire world, and, the, like, every Marine loves him, every citizen loves him. You, you know what I mean? Like, the only, and he strikes terror in the hearts of every pirate pirate worldwide. So if it wasn't for that, those crazy accolades, Garp would have been reprimanded and probably given like a court martial for like insubordination and like discharged at this point. But that's not, you can't touch him, you know, can't touch Garp. All right. Anyway, um, that's the video. Hope you all enjoyed a uh, lot of stuff to still dissect with the chapter. Probably going to talk about the Nerona family, uh, Eames family coming up next. So pay attention to that and we'll see how that goes. I don't have any vulture facts for you today. Uh, but yeah, getting back into it. And now we have a big break. So we got to think of a lot of other stuff to talk about. Thanks for watching, everybody. This will be Teching, signing out.